I just want to invite you, if you would, take your copy of God's Word and look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And we're going to talk tonight about working together. Uh, one of the great joys of, of being a pastor is, is working together. And one of the things I love to do is to, to, to get people <clears throat> moving in the right de- direction and building the church and building the kingdom of God and joining God and what he is at work in and and I enjoy seeing people take their giftedness number one discover it and then take that giftedness and begin to use the use it in the in the body of Christ within the family and this portion of first Thessalonians it it deals with how we are to work together it really deals with family matters of of how we're to relate to one another within the church and how do we respond to one another and and how do we conduct ourselves uh, within the the body of Christ and there's nothing more important in the body of Christ and understanding kind of where we fit in and and how do we work together and how we look out for one another and how we're not against one another we're not fighting against one another I mean this is a a, a team this is a, a family is really the best analogy and and we know how family goes sometimes it's hard to be in family family issues happen in families and so we're going to see uh, what God's word says about that so we're going to look and we're going to look at just a few verses tonight and verses 12 down to verse number 15 Paul writing says but we request of you brethren that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love because of their work live in peace with one another We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Now, whenever you read verse number 12 and, and, and 13, it's one of those passages that as a pastor is kind of hard, uh, hard to kind of talk about because it's really saying that you need to appreciate those who lead you. You need to appreciate your, your pastors. And I can't tell you that if not weekly, at least monthly, without a doubt, I talk with pastors that struggle in churches. I, I talk to so many of those pastors that have felt the, the disappointment of, of ministry within a church. I felt the, the pain in their heart from family matters that have gone wrong within the church and how they have been done wrong. I, I can't tell you, just within the last year, uh, I, I can name four specific pastors that are no longer in their church uh, because of conflict that happened within the church. And really, what we find is a lack of appreciation for, for leadership. And don't get me wrong, some pastors uh, probably deserve to to not be at their church any any longer but the problem is is it all comes down to this there's a failure to love there's a failure to communicate through love there's a failure to try to get on the same page to make sure that you're going in the right direction and it's interesting when you look at church history we look at Jonathan Edwards Jonathan Edwards Probably the greatest theologian of his day could be one of the greatest theologians in American history. Jonathan Edwards, who was the, the, at the epicenter of the First Great Awakening, one of the greatest moves of God uh, in the United States of America happened under Jonathan Edwards' preaching. Jonathan Edwards was at his church for 23 years. And after 23 years of ministry and 23 years of preaching the truth, and, and if you ever read any of Jonathan Edwards' sermons, uh, um, you got to be awake, first of all, because they're very weighty. Uh, that, that Puritan language, and, 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 and you hear it, it's just so rich with theology. 23 years, and after 23 years, they ran him out of his church. Matter of fact, they not only ran him out of his church, church they they so put him down that Jonathan Edwards could not find another church even in that area and before Jonathan Edwards died the only church that he could find a position is is he had a a small group of American Indians 
that he was teaching basic Christian theology to. Jonathan Edwards. What about the great Baptist pastor Charles Spurgeon? Charles Spurgeon, probably the greatest Baptist preacher that has ever preached. John, whenever Charles Spurgeon would, would preach his sermons, he would then go and they would be put in print. And it was often said there was not one ship that left London without a copy of that week's sermon by Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon's sermons were actually published in New York newspapers here in the United States. He would preach them one Sunday. The next Sunday, they would be in American newspapers. And yet Charles Spurgeon was voted out of the Baptist London Union. As a matter of fact, the second, the person who seconded the vote to vote him out of the Baptist Union was his assistant or associate pastor, David. His associate pastor. <clears throat> and to make it worse, David, it was his brother. It was his own brother. Charles Spurgeon. And I share those two stories because if, if you know anything about theology, anything about church history, those two men are held in high esteem today. Those two men are honored among theologians and young pastors. We'll go and we'll read and quote Jonathan Edwards and Charles Spurgeon. And yet we see that at the end of their lives they were not even appreciated for it. And by the way... Historians say Charles Spurgeon never got over that vote. Matter of fact, they said that it led to periods of great depression and ultimately he died a premature death and many people believe he was grieved to death because of that vote out of the Baptist Union. When I certainly, hopefully, don't anticipate <laughs> Edward's fate or Spurgeon's fate, I am at the same time understanding that it could happen to me. It could happen to David, Richard, Brandon, David Petro, Larry, any pastor in this community. And whenever I come and I, I read what Paul is saying here, he said, we request, we request you, brethren, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you and the Lord and give you instruction. Now, some translations use the word Lord. Uh, it just speaks of leadership here. And I don't know, one of the more weightier texts for me as a pastor is when I think about my responsibility is, is to think that I'll have the responsibility of watching over your your souls and just yesterday I, I heard some news of uh, of a family in, in in our church it just broke my heart week in and week out there there are things that get back to me and I see whether or not it's someone's caught in sin or or some child of theirs has gone wayward or 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 who knows what it could be I mean, there's a multitude of things that, that, that pastors go through. But I can't think of anything more honorable than to think that, that I have this great duty of instruction and to be part of what God is doing. You know, there, there's, there's pretty simple when you look at what God is up to. When you look at, at the New Testament, I love being part of the church because it is the only institution, I want you to listen to me, it is the only institution Christ promised that he would build and bless. There is only one thing that Christ is in this world doing and that is building up his church. Why would you not want to be part of that if you think about that that is what God is up to in all of history and in the, in the big narrative of history that, that this building of the church, everything that happens in history is a backdrop which has set this redemptive story. 
Everything you can look at. You can look at the Babylonian Empire. You can look at the Assyrian Empire. You can look at the Roman Empire. You can look at the, the British Empire. You can look at the American Empire, Russian Empire, Chinese. You can look at all of those empires. And when it's set against God's history, there's nothing else that, that even comes close to what Christ is doing. All of that is just the backdrop of Christ building his church. You say, well, pastor, that's, that's kind of, kind of uh, big-eyed, don't you think? That's a little naive, isn't it? No, it's not. It's not. People often ask me, well, pastor, what would you do, do if, you, if you didn't preach? And my response has always been, there's nothing else I could do. There's nothing else I could do. There's nothing else that would satisfy the longing in my soul. There's nothing I could do. God has placed this fire within me to build the church of the living Christ and to see Christ glorified and to see you glorify Christ in how you live your life. There's nothing else that I could do. I've often been asked, what age are you going to retire? Retire? How, how can you retire? How can you step back in this grand story of redemption that God has called me into in the building of his church? How can you retire? Now, let me just say this. I may retire from this church sometime because this ain't no uh, old man's game here. <laughs> It takes a young guy to, to pastor a church like this and, and, to, and to do this. So I may not necessarily be pastoring this church for the next 30, 40, 50 years, however long the Lord wants me to live. But I'm going to be preaching somewhere and I'm going to be building the body of Christ because that's what God has called me to do. And I do that, and let me, let me say this without any, any reservation. I do this not for your appreciation. I do it because I want to please the Lord. And I think about it, though, but, but, but I think about growing up. I just, I just think about how my home church and, and how we, we appreciated our, our pastor. And that's one of the things that my grandmothers and my mom and dad taught me is a, a love for our pastor and how we just would, would just en encourage him and we would do everything we could to appreciate him and to lift him up and, and to say how much we, we love him. And I just want to encourage you to do this, not for my sake, but for every other staff member, sometime this week or sometime this month, just write a letter, give them a phone call, send them a text, stop by their office, and just, just tell them how much you appreciate them. Because I'm just telling you, I, I, I don't know how, I don't know any of you would know how many hours these guys really put in around here. I mean, these guys work and work and work and they labor and they do so because that is the calling on their life so I just want to encourage you to to appreciate these guys and so after he says that that that's what we're to, to do is that that we're to to appreciate those who are in charge over us and 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 those who give instruction and that you esteem them very highly in love look look what it says very highly in love because of their work and live at peace with one another. I often find that odd. Why would he be talking about leadership and then talking about loving the pastors and then live in peace with one another? Some of the ugliest fights I've ever seen have been in church. <laughs> and God says that we're to, to live at, at peace with one another. Why, why? Why do we live at peace with one another? Because we're in this together. This is not the pastor and the people and the people and the pastor. This is, we're working together. We're a family. And then what does he do? He goes into just a little bit of Christian conduct. Or he begins to set some house rules. Because this is a family. He begins to go through and, and give us some instruction. In verse number 14, we urge you, brethren, to admonish the unruly. He says to take care of the members, to admonish the wayward men or members. The, the word um, wayward there, or unruly, means 
careless. It's a picture of someone being out of line. It applies to a soldier who could not keep rank, but instead he kept on marching to his, his own way. And we've been called to lovingly admonish those that have gone wayward. And by the way, there are rules in the family. We know that. I mean, I don't know about you, but in my home, there are house rules that everybody goes by. Nobody is, 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 is you know, immune to the rules that happen within the home. There are those house rules. And this is the same way in the body of Christ. I mean, the, the Bible is filled with instruction on church discipline and how do we handle those that are unruly. And, and unfortunately, that's what we have to do. And, and I look at it this way. I mean, it, it, those of you who have multiple children, you know this, not every child is alike. They're not. I mean, even how you discipline those children is very different. And we need to be careful, and, and as a pastor, and, and when those times come that I have to go talk to an individual that's kind of gone wayward, I understand that I have to have the conversation, but every conversation is, is different. And one of the things I don't want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to rob that child of, of his identity. I want their, them to keep their creativity, and I know that, that that children rebel and and you have to handle those children differently but you need to let those children know I love you I want the best for you but you need to understand there are house rules that there are certain things there are certain standards in the house there are certain standards in the house of God and so our job is we have to look at those wayward members and as the text says that that we have to admonish the unruly but then we encourage the faint Hearted, the worried members. You know what that word literally means? It means little sold. The little sold people. Now, what does that mean, Pastor? Those who are very timid, those who are afraid. Dare I use the word those who are prone to quit? Yeah, there are quitters in the church. There are those that will get their feelings hurt. There are those that doesn't go their way and all of a sudden they're just going to give up on the family. They're just going to walk away and, and they're going to have their feelings hurt. And by the way, there are those in our family families. You know that. My two children, uh, they're, they're different between night and day. Uh, Abigail, she's not in here. Don't say anything about this. I hope she's not in here. She was downstairs working in the nursery. She's a lot like her dad. She's so much like me, and, 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 and sometimes it, I have to kind of handle her a little more care than, than I did with Andrea. You know, I, Andrea, I could just, you know, just, and she could just take it. I can look at Abigail and just barely raise my voice, and it's, oh, good <laughs> And it's interesting, the word that he uses here. That need to be encouraged. The King James uses the word comfort. It's a compound Greek word here. It's paramuthos. It, it, it means near. Para means near. Muthos means speech. And what does it mean? How, how do we go and, and how do we talk to those who are little sold? It is the, the word picture is we get close to them and we tenderly talk to them. If there's a person who is faint-hearted and there's that person that's prone to quit, I mean, you just can't go in there and just give them both barrels and let them have it and then think they're going to come back the next week. There's, there's just a way you have to handle those that are, that are, that are little sold. And that's something I've had to, to, to learn. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, my dad, uh, uh, he had no concept of what a little sold person was. <laughs> I mean, I, I just got thick skin in a hurry uh, with my dad. Uh, but I, I've learned as, as, as a pastor, you, you've got to handle people differently and to know that there are those that, that are weak, and there are those that are weak in so many different ways. And to think that within the body of Christ, there are those that are strong, and, and then there are those that are, that, are, that are weak. And that's what the third thing that we see here. Again, we... We encourage, we, we draw near tenderly to the faint-hearted, but we help those that are weak. The, the phrase literally means hold fast to the weak. That means don't let them fall. Who are the weak in Christ? 
The weak in Christ are those that really haven't understood what liberty in Christ is all about. Those who are, are weak in Christ really haven't understood what Galatians is all about. Those who are weak in Christ, they still want to live somewhat under the law. They still want to, almost let's call it legalist. They, they, they don't know how to, uh, how to live free in Christ and they're always looking at other people. And, and you know, whenever you go look in Romans 14 and Romans 15 and you begin to see what Paul unpacks there and, and what, who eats meat and who do not eat meat and, and all of those things there, there are those who are strong in the faith and those who are weak in the faith. And just like any family... Just like any family, there are some children that mature quicker than others, and it's that way in the body of Christ. There are some who come to know Christ in just a matter of time. They're in the Word, and they're growing, and they're maturing, and yet there are some people who have been in church maybe their entire life, and they're still weak in the faith, and they're not strong. And so we're not talking about how many years that you've been a follower of Christ because the number of years that you've been following Christ does not equate maturity in Christ. The question is, is whether or not in those years have you matured, have you been reading and studying God's Word, has God been sanctifying you and growing you, and can you look back for, to where you were 10 years ago to where you are today and say, I am more mature today than I was 10 years ago. Now in all this, when you think about what, what Paul is saying here is we take care of the wayward, the worried, and the, the weak members. Th this kind of personal ministry, guess what? It's not easy. It is not easy dealing with, with thousands of, of people. Somebody asked the other day, how many members do you have over at Second Baptist Church? Well, I, I think it's something around 2,700 in a given month, there'll be around 16 or 1,700 different individuals that will come to this campus. Can you just think, just think for a moment? Can, can you just think of the magnitude of, of your pastors here instructing, overseeing, leading 1,600 different people, 1,600 different personalities, 1,600 different people in different places in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 1,600 di different people with different attitudes toward the church and toward leadership and toward God. No wonder when we get down here, he, he says that be patient with everyone. Be patient with everyone. I wish I could say I was the most patient person in the world, but God continues to teach me patience. There, there's some weeks that, that I just go home and, 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 I, and I just, I, I walk in the house and, and, and Leslie, she just sees it on my face. She goes, well, what happened today? <laughs> I'm like, you don't even want to know. You don't even want to know. You, you just do not even want to know. Be patient with everyone. Do you know that the, uh, it's been joked and people say this, ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people. You ever heard that said? Do you understand that, that as different as we are, how big our family is and, and, and what it takes through prayer and through submission to one another to, to working on harmony and working on unity and working on our love? How do we keep this thing together? It is but by the grace of God that we do what we do here. Make no mistake about it. I mean, it's, it's hard enough. There's four people. Well, now there's three. Andrea's gone. But when she was at home, there was just four in the house. And to keep four people happy is hard sometimes. Amen? He says, be, be patient. We need to be patient. It takes patience to, to raise a family. It takes patience to, to live together in unity and harmony because he, he, God understood what, what we wanted to do. He understood what we want to do. Look what verse number 15 says. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, 
but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. God understood that whenever we don't get our way and, and things aren't going the way we should, we just want to repay evil for evil. We want to retaliate. That's like the human nature. That's, that's Brian wanting to come out. In, in my house, we call it little Gene. That's my dad. That's Gene wanting to come out. Now, I love what we read in Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. Now, listen to this. Romans 12, 17 through 21. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you. By the way, you're only responsible for you because you can't make anybody else do anything else. You, you can only take care of you. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him drink. For in doing, you will heap burning coals upon his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And he's here, Paul in Romans is talking about how we treat our enemies. And we're talking in Thessalonians about the body of Christ. We're talking about the family. How we, we can't repay evil for evil. One of the greatest lessons that God teaches me, I mean, day in and day out, is, is understanding what loving kindness is all about. What, what does it mean to have a heart of loving kindness? What is it like when someone, someone in the, the family talks bad about you? I, I know what it feels like for, for those in the family to make accusations towards you. I know what it feels like to, to, to be in the, the body of Christ and have the, the darts thrown at you and to, to question you. I, listen, I know what it's like for people in community to do that. I understand that. But my heart has learned to, to just walk in loving kindness and, and to know that that's what Christ would do. Regardless of what anybody says to me, and here's the hardest thing, what anybody says to my family, that in loving kindness, I have to be patient. You see, if your motive, listen to this, if your motive is a desire for appreciation and praise, you're going to be sorely disappointed. As you minister to, to people in the church, whether it's through your life group or whatever ministry that you're in, and when you're ministering and you're doing that and you're doing it only for appreciation, you're sorely going to be disappointed. If your motive is ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake, as 2 Corinthians 4, 5 says, you will never be disappointed. That we do it all for the sake of Christ. We do it for the glory of Christ because I want to back up and just say this everything that we do it is joining Christ in doing the one thing that he's at work doing and that's building his church every night when you cut the news on and you see things happening all over the world and, and that's the headlines. And you can get USA Today and you can see the front page of USA Today tomorrow. And you can see that headline and you can read what it says. But you know what the greatest news that's happening? is Christ is building his church and that's just the backdrop against which he is doing that. And to think, you're part of this story that God's writing. The greatest story that is being written in all of humanity is the building up of Christ church that you're a part of and that your responsibility as part of the family is, is to appreciate those who are leading, to look out for the wayward, for the worried, and for the weak, do it with great patience, and make sure that you don't pay back evil for evil. Understand what it means to live in God's loving kindness.